Oftentimes, local policy changes are the ones that are going to influence your day-to-day most directly and the ones where your voice has the most power because you're closer to the decision makers. For example, if your hospital was proposing policies around mandatory overtime or floating throughout the hospital, you would really be impacted by those decisions. But chances are people who are making the decisions are also those that you're interacting with on a routine basis, like the nurse managers or directors and leadership within your organization. So being involved and sharing your knowledge and experience with the decision makers can really influence the outcome. You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Lenise Taylor, Oncology Clinical Specialist at ONS. Today, we're talking with Erica fisher Cartledge, Chief Clinical Officer at ONS, about oncology nursing advocacy. You can also earn free NCPD contact hours after listening to this episode and completing the evaluation we've linked in the episode notes. Thank you for joining us today, Erica. We just spent three days together in Washington, D.C. at ONS at Capitol Hill Days learning about how we as nurses can advocate for our patients. It's nice to be able to share this information on a broader scale. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and chat about the experience. Can you share a little bit about how you got into advocacy? Sure. It was actually completely by accident that I became involved. At the time, I was a clinical nurse specialist in New York and title protection regulations were um, being passed in the state that had the potential to substantially affect myself and several of my colleagues. So we got together and we put a letter together on behalf of the organization with the support of our chief nursing officer that had recommendations. And we sent it into the state during the public comment period. And then we almost all of the recommendations were accepted into the final law. Uh, It was really empowering to see that we were able to influence something so important. And I realized at that time, if I had been more aware and involved, I probably could have influenced the bill more even before it was signed into law. It is so important to be aware of regulations that could be changing related to our nursing practice. Something similar to your example happened to the CNSs in Washington State. It was my first experience in understanding rules and laws in relation to scope of practice and how a group of nurses could affect change by educating our lawmakers. It's so important. And I think until it happens to you, you may not even realize how essential it is. So true. Can you talk a little bit about the different levels of advocacy? I'm really glad that you asked that. One of the things I think that often happens is we think of advocacy and policy and our minds automatically go to the national level in Washington, D.C., But advocacy at the local level, even within an organization or regionally at the state level, are just as important, if not more, sometimes. And there are so many ways for nurses to become involved. And it can be simple things just like voting or being knowledgeable on the issues. And then even bigger, like supporting a candidate or communicating with legislators. That is so true. Thinking of getting involved on a national level can be overwhelming. The local involvement feels more bite-sized and more real to the nurse. Can you talk more about why local advocacy is just as important as national advocacy? Oftentimes, local policy changes are the ones that are going to influence your day-to-day most directly and the ones where your voice has the most power because you're closer to the decision makers. For example, if your hospital was proposing policies around mandatory overtime or floating throughout the hospital, you would really be impacted by those decisions. But chances are people who are making the decisions are also those that you're interacting with on a routine basis, like the nurse managers or directors and leadership within your organization. So being involved and sharing your knowledge and experience with the decision makers can really influence the outcome. Sharing your voice is really important. What advocacy opportunities has ONS led you to? So in 2016, I had the opportunity to participate in Capitol Hill Days for the very first time. That really raised my awareness about the importance of my role in this area. And then, as you mentioned, we were just back on the Hill again this month, and I was able to participate again. And it was even better the second time around, having had that experience under my belt. 
Now in my current role as the chief clinical officer, I work really closely with Alec, our government affairs director, to review pending legislation or hot topics and assess the clinical impact and how we should respond as an organization. I am really looking forward to going back to Capitol Hill days for a second time and having the nervousness not be there. Oh, yes. (laughs) How was your experience with ONS Capitol Hill days? Echo that sentiment. The first time I went, I was so nervous because I really knew nothing about policy or lobbying, but the experience was incredible. That whole first day um, when you really learn everything you need to know about how to speak with the representatives and their staff, and then you learn about the current bills that are impacting nurses and oncology patients. I was definitely nervous the first time getting out there and doing it, but I really felt very well prepared and the experience was incredible. Obviously, it led me back there again. When I was there in 2016, we got to meet then Vice President Biden while we were there, which was incredible. Going back this time, the structure was the same, but my confidence was definitely higher having experienced it before. And also, I think just having more awareness of the importance of advocacy and my role with it. I think this time around, my favorite part was hearing directly from nurses who are representatives in the House or legislative aides on the Hill and how their healthcare background is so important to what they do day to day. I don't think we typically think of nurses in those roles and to really see them and hear from them was a really unique opportunity. I agree. Speaking with those nurses was very impactful because it gave another non-traditional role of a nurse and how we can really make and affect change. That is quite an experience. How has your understanding of the difference between policy and politics helped you as a health policy advocate? I think that's really the key. Politics and policy are very different things. I am not a very political person. It's not something I enjoy discussing with people because I find that it's really become very divisive. But policy I see as a responsibility to my patients and my colleagues now. And I really understand how the two are separate. Politics, which is largely about the process of how things get done, is different from the policy, which is the principles we have to guide what we do. I may not like the process of how something gets done, but that doesn't mean I can turn away from the decisions that are made through the process because they're going to be the standards that govern my day to day. Whatever side of the aisle you fall on, ultimately, we want to do what's best for the patients and the profession. That's what the policy is all about. This is such a good distinction. We need to not shy away from helping to inform policy because we don't like the way the decisions are made. Why is it important for oncology nurses to advocate for healthcare? Nurses are a really powerful voice. There are over 4 million of us in the United States, and it's important to realize that healthcare advocacy is often for changes that directly impact our patients, but it can often relate to the professional topics as well that impact nursing care delivery. Um, This is incredibly important to point out because if nurses aren't advocating for nurses, who's going to do it? Next, I think it's essential because we're good at it. Um, It's innate to what we do as nurses. Patient advocacy is a core tenant of our profession. And no one would ever question our role in advocating for a patient on the unit if they needed a better pain management plan or home care for safe discharge. It's really the same concept, but at a broader level. Nurses interface with patients all day and we hear their struggles and what their needs are. And it's our opportunity and really, I think, responsibility to then advocate for the things that are going to make it easier for them. That is so true. Alec has a saying that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. It is so important that we use our voice and our expertise to inform those decisions, not just be the recipient of the decision. How does a nurse's clinical knowledge help advance healthcare policies? Well, in almost all of the cases, individuals who are voting and bringing forward legislation for decisions have absolutely no clinical background. I think right now, of all of the people in the House of Representatives and the Senate, three of them are nurses. The people there that are making those decisions rely heavily on our clinical knowledge to make good decisions and to know what side to advocate for. In a prior role that I held in a hospital, I would sometimes be contacted by our advocacy office when legislation related to scalp pooling would come up because I was one of our project leaders on the topic. They would use my knowledge of the intervention and the literature to guide their decision making. The more accurate, current, and easy it is to get that kind of clinical knowledge to the people making the decisions, the hope is that the better decisions will be made. So being in a position to share that clinical knowledge as a nurse is really essential because of the real life experience that we have. You've talked a lot about the importance of advocating and policymaking. How has advocacy guided your nursing career? 
I think becoming involved in advocacy helped to provide a wider lens by which to kind of see the healthcare world. Um, since I first became exposed to healthcare advocacy, I've both held direct care nursing roles and leadership roles. And the advocacy experiences have really helped me see the environment I work in from a different perspective. I think it's also made me a stronger candidate as I've moved into leadership roles. The things that make a good advocate, being passionate, articulate in an argument, collaborative, and a bit of negotiation are all things that also make good healthcare leaders. And so more than that, it also really showed me how rewarding it is to make a difference on a national scale. That wider lens is so important. It's that piece of going from novice to expert and learning more about not just your patient, but your unit and then your hospital and then what's going on in the world around you. Speaking of making a difference on a national level, you're ONS's new chief clinical officer. How are you using advocacy in your new role? Well, it's a huge part of what I've been doing in this role, even from week one. As a trusted resource in oncology, ONS is often asked to engage with various topics that are up for decision that will impact nurses or oncology patients. So when Alec, our director of health policy, receives these, he will send them to me and the clinical team to weigh in. And it can be on a really wide variety of topics. Some of the things that have recently come forward are things like restrictions for anti-nausea medications, where prescribers would be required to order certain drugs before others. As nurses, we know that this doesn't take into account things like the individualized experience that patients have in their past. It also doesn't take into account anticipatory nausea and vomiting, which can have a psychological impact on patients, and that a single severe episode of chemo-induced nausea vomiting can lead to anticipatory nausea vomiting. This is the type of clinical knowledge that we share then with those who are deciding whether to support or oppose that legislation. Another recent example that we had was regarding if ONS should participate in advocating for a medically necessary dental benefit to support increasing oral health coverage for those on Medicare who have had neck cancers. As part of this work, I pulled recent literature and CCN standards that discuss the importance of preventative and proactive dental care for patients and the risks associated with not taking those precautions. That information was then used to put together a comment in support of the proposed legislation for coverage that was sent on behalf of ONS. So that's just a smattering of some of the things that I get to be a part of in this new role to really make sure that we're representing the best interests of our patients and our members. That is so exciting. And those are some really good examples of how we can share our clinical expertise to help others make informed decisions. None of us as oncology nurses want any of our patients to have nausea and vomiting. We know that it can be prevented. And to have people making decisions based on the cost of a medication just seems wrong. And we need to be doing what we can to advocate for them. Why should all nurses, even those not actively involved in advocacy, stay current on healthcare policies? Nurses really need to keep their pulse on what's happening in healthcare on the patient side, but also in their specialties and roles. Healthcare is a really fast paced environment. And it's easy to watch changes happen to you, which can be frustrating if you aren't part of the conversations before they become decisions. I spoke earlier about how I first became involved in advocacy during the title protection changes for clinical nurse specialists. I'll never forget the feeling of sitting in a room at a conference and hearing someone else talk about a law that was being passed that was going to affect me and I had no idea about it. It was a really uncomfortable sensation that drove me to never want to be in that position again. That is such a good example and is such an uncomfortable feeling and hopefully one that most of us will never face. But it is certainly something that can help you feel like you should be more involved. As you know, we have three quick questions we ask in each episode. So with our first one, what are common misconceptions about advocacy as a nurse? I think the biggest is that you need special training, an interest in politics or experience to get started. Really, all you need is to want to do what's best for patients and nurses and a willingness to learn. Along those lines, what do oncology nurses need to better assist them with advocating? Awareness, I think, is the biggest thing that nurses need. Take the time to read what issues are up for discussion and the implications of them. Sign up for newsletters related to healthcare advocacy so you're routinely informed as well. Think about what you would want the people who are making the decisions on the issues to know. These are small steps that can really be the foundation. I would also suggest to just making sure that you're getting information from a bipartisan source or that you're not only getting it from one source so that you're really seeing multiple sides of an issue. 
That is very important. What are some additional resources for oncology nurses who want to learn more? The ONS Center for Advocacy and Health Policy is a really rich resource that I go to a lot. There's great information and it's available in a lot of different formats. So regardless of how you like to learn, there are options for you. There's articles, there's websites to go to, webinars, podcasts. There's also a regular email that you can sign up for that Alex sends, which keeps you in the loop on what's happening. And I highly recommend that. If you're looking to broaden your advocacy knowledge beyond just oncology issues, the ANA also has a robust website with current news related to nursing issues, an advocacy toolkit, and a state-level monitoring um, site for issues related to nursing. That is a really good site. Do you have any final comments for us? You can't assume someone else is going to get out there and advocate for what your patient needs or what you need. I spent a lot of years in my career thinking that this isn't for me or it's someone else's role. And I realize now that it's really all of our responsibility to own. And I'm so happy that ONS has the resources it does to help nurses step forward to their patients and themselves. Thank you so much for sharing this with us, Erica. I think that the topic of advocacy is something that people shy away from. And just by giving us this little bit of information. It's given us ideas of how we can dip our toe in the water and find something that we're passionate about and lend our voice to that. For you listeners, don't forget you can get NCPD by completing an evaluation that is linked in the episode notes. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part of this episode by leaving a review wherever you download your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. The ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guests and not necessarily ONS.